Hello and good morning everyone. Thank you for joining us here today. Um, welcome to the Network Management Made Easy breakout session. My name is Peter Davis Adkins. I'm one of the sales specialists that work in Cisco's enterprise networking team here in the UK. And I'm joined by Ben Brophy, one of Hi our everyone. system engineers. Um, and here, we're here today to just share with you some insights around what we're doing in around the network management space, but I also think there's a little bit more to it um, than just that, which I'm, I'm sure you'll see as we kind of progress through. So we do actually have a demo for you today, so we can actually showcase this capability. And it's probably well worthwhile saying now that if any of you are particularly interested in getting further under the hood or having a more technical discussion about this, then do come and join us, come and see us at the stand. We're literally a C28, so just kind of as you came in by the entrance, you can't miss us, we're right in front of you there. But before we kind of get into the meat of it, what I wanted to do is kind of do the, you know, a bit of the, the market, architecture type stuff with you guys here today, because I wanted to kind of share with you why we feel that we're really having to bring about a change in the way that you actually design, deploy, and operate your networks today. And the first piece, I think, you know, it's a very overused term, but is around digitization. You know, really kind of what are we talking about here is the increased utilization of technology by all of all businesses today to either enhance new business models, create new services for customers, but ultimately be competitive. Because there are much smaller organizations out there for a lot of us more established businesses that you know are nipping at heels and you know trying to get access to our customers and build loyalty and build their brand. And we've got to keep pace with that. And this whole ideology of digitization and more technology, um, Gartner predicting around 24 million new devices will connect to networks by 2020 on a daily basis. So you think about managing a network today, think about your own personal challenges about how you might have had to have dealt with BYOD onboarding and, and, and all these new trends created by smart devices over the years. It, it's, you know, it's quite staggering. The other piece which I think is a real pain point for so many customers that we speak to is the cost of operation. So globally, it's a $60 billion industry operating networks today. And on average, for every $1 that's invested into a piece of network infrastructure, you're then spending a further two to $7 to then operate that network. Things just can't continue to work in that way. And that requires quite a pivotal shift, like I said, in the way that we actually look to design, deploy, and operate these networks. Furthermore, on the last piece, which is, we're doing another session on this later on today, so do come and join us back in this room at 1.40 on network security, because essentially this attack service, all these additional devices, is making, making well, creating more opportunities for malicious parties and attackers to take advantage of us in ways that we don't want and prevent us from actually working and you know, delivering the services that we want to to our customers and generate the revenues which we need to. So on that, what I'm gonna do is pass over to Ben and hopefully Ben, you can show these guys where we're actually going and what that's starting to look like and why we need to start making some of these changes and how we're actually gonna deploy some of those changes today. Yep, thank you very much, Pete. Uh, so hopefully everyone can, can hear me okay. So let's take a step back and actually look what a campus is. So many of you will be familiar with this. Uh, this is your typical three-tier architecture. So we've got access layer switches, aggregation switches, and core switches. Pretty simple. Then what we might do is we might add some wireless to this as well with wireless LAN controller and access points. Then we'll plug some endpoints in. We'll connect it up to our branch and WAN and our data center as well. Then maybe we want to add some policy to the network, so we'll add a NAC system perhaps. Of course, we need something to manage it as well. Okay, and then we'll add some protocols. So all of these protocols that network engineers are very familiar with. So at every single layer, we might add things like ether channel, span and tree, VLANs, HSRP, acronyms go on and on and on. And then finally, in this SDN era, it would be rude not to add an SDN controller. So what I'm trying to get across here is the campus is very crit uh, the campus network is very critical to your business. If it goes down, then potentially the business can go down. Uh, you know, things can stop working. Um, but it's also extremely complex. And you can see that from this slide. Complex to operate, it's complex to scale, and um, effectively, you know, 
how we've configured this network traditionally has been hopping on, on box by box and operating it with a very CLI manual driven way. So how can we start to address some of these challenges? Well, one of the ways we can address it is to actually separate out the forwarding of data from the IT services that we want to create. And we can do this by creating a fabric. So you might already be familiar with fabrics. We've seen them before in the data center and the WAN. But now we're starting to see fabrics in the campus as well. So for those of you that don't know, uh, fabric is, you can think of it as one big switch, effectively. And we get a lot of benefits from this. So we get secure segmentation and role-based access control without implementing very complex technologies like MPLS. We get host mobility as well. So we'd no longer have to stretch VLANs. We also get flexibility for layer two and layer three anywhere in the network. So no longer do we have to worry about blocking links with span and tree, for example. And I think this is a key one. We're actually now decoupling the network policy from the topology. So no longer are we having to rely on things like IP address to implement a security policy. And when you think about it, that makes a lot of sense because an IP address is just a way to get around the network. It's a network construct. It, it's uh, never really been designed for security. So this is all great, but arguably we've introduced more complexity here. We've got more protocols working under the scenes. And for the most part, this is all very CLI driven. So how do we actually address that? Well, if you want your fabric to be automated centrally and, um, and be programmable, we have something called DNA Center. So DNA Center is our, um, our SDN controller for the campus, and it can extend to the branch as well. Um, and this is the central place where you'll start to configure some of these policies. You'll also hear a lot from Cisco as part of our network intuitive announcement. A lot of uh, stuff around software defined access or SDA. Uh, if you want to know more, feel free to visit us on our stand opposite here, C28. Um, but just to put it in perspe into perspective, what do we mean by SDA, software defined access? That's campus fabric, which you've seen here. GUI automation through DNA Center, and analytics and assurance, which we'll be announcing later on in November. So with that, let's have a look at a demo. And while Ben's bringing up that demo, just to give everyone a bit of background, because I'm sure you've heard and seen lots of different management tools from Cisco over the years. And to be very clear here, what we're looking at here is DNA Center, which is the user interface into that SDN controller, which we call APIC EM, APIC Enterprise Module. This is sitting on APIC EM version two. Okay, we have had version one, which is available for free download of the Cisco DevNet website. So you can try and test some of these capabilities in your, your own environment, and we do encourage you to do that. There are learning labs as well available, so you can learn some of the best practices from a number of our engineers. But then there's also a question, because I'm sure a number of you also use or have used plat platforms such as Prime Infrastructure. So where does that fit? Well, a lot of the capabilities within Prime have started to migrate into this platform here. But to be very clear, Prime is more static, ad hoc, task-driven um, troubleshooting, configuration, management of the actual network infrastructure itself. DNA Center is really focused on like I said before, design, deploying, operate, automating functions. We refer to it internally as a system of change and prime more of a system of record. Okay, so we're looking at this platform here to drive the network, drive configuration, automate BAU type tasks, which are essential to save cost for our customers. But at the same time where there's painstaking, great technologies that so many of our customers have seen significant value in so things such as secure group tagging. Box by box configuration of those services has been cost prohibitive for many of those. So unless you've got a big budget, how do you get that out there? This tool set provides you with the mechanisms to actually deliver and deploy those through very simple UI in a drag and drop, you know, push and click type fashion. So without further ado, Ben, if you want to go through the demonstration here and show the guys what this is all about, it'd be great. Yep, absolutely. So as Pete says, this is DNA Center. And at the bottom, we've got a whole bunch of tools. And if you're familiar with APKM today, those 
tools have been inherited into DNA Center. So things like the discovery tool, topology, and network plug and play to actually get all of your devices into DNA Center in the first place with ease. But we've also introduced some new applications. So design, policy, and provision. And later on, we'll add an assurance app as well for the analytics piece. So effectively now, uh, you rather than having lots of different tools to go to and having to in your mind piece everything together We're trying to bring it all into one place So let's have a look at design first of all To put this into context this may be the job of a network designer or a solution architect and They may look at the network uh, come up with IP addressing schemes using Excel spreadsheets. They may have CAD drawings of buildings and things like that. And then they have to piece all of this together and have conference calls and then eventually hand that over to someone in delivery that will actually install the kit. What we're doing here, first of all, is we're building up a hierarchy of our network, essentially the characteristics of what the network's looking like. So let's say we're a global business. We can build this up on a global level, country level, a site level, building level, and even right down to a floor level. So you can see here that we've got USA, we've got it's in San Jose, building 14, and then we have the fourth floor here. So I've actually uploaded one of our maps here of the floor. And then I can actually start adding things to here. For example, an access point, I can place it onto my map. So already I've mapped out some basic characteristics of the network. So just to be clear here, Ben, are there any caveats or restrictions on the scale? So you mentioned global. You know, could this span out to 100, 200, you know, sites? Is it good for, you know, two or three sites? What, what's that look like? Yeah, that's a very good question. I mean, theoretically, there's no scale. As you've seen here, you can operate on a global level. But maybe you, you only want to start off with one site. You can absolutely do that. So you can see here, we've, we've just created one site. So if we actually take a look at the network settings, like AAA server, DHCP, so how you get an IP address, how you find your DNS server, these are very common network settings that will apply to every device in your infrastructure, all of your routers, all of your switches. But having to go box by box isn't a great scalable way to actually achieve that. So you will have some common network settings which you can push out globally. But if you want to override that, you absolutely can do that as well on a per site basis, on a per floor basis, however you really want to do it. So next we can actually add some device credentials. So this is how we are talking to the device, whether it be CLI, SNMP, HTTP, even NetConf and Yang, some more programmatic ways of actually accessing the devices. That can all be added here. And then I've added a address pool as well. So through DNA Center, I can add very easily an address pool for corporate. There we go, I've set that up with a default gateway. And you can see how many addresses are free there. And this is a, a good place to just pause you on because most customers I'm, I meet and speak to use their own tools. It might be you know, Excel or it might be like an IPAM tool like Infoblox. I mean, I've heard lots about APIs with this platform, but could you explain to everyone in the room, do they have to start afresh and go you know, Cisco through and through or is there a way that they can kind of do any integration? Yeah, so you can actually create your address pools here as I've, as I've just shown. Uh, but we realize you know, a lot of customers don't want to start from scratch and they may already have an existing tools like Infoblox, these IPAM tools. So through the API integration, we can very easily bring that into DNA Center um, and that will just map out your existing IP addressing scheme. So yeah. And then finally, wireless in the schemes of the fabric is just as important as wired these days. So this is why we can actually add an SSID that can apply globally as well. So to give you an example, if I go into Cisco with my phone into any building, I will get an SSID called Blizzard. So I don't have to mess around with entering new passwords or anything. I can seamlessly roam around any Cisco site. So this is a great way to, to configure that centrally if you need to. One other thing to mention as well is you can push out images centrally here. So think about iOS images for your network devices. And then the whole objective of this design piece is for the solution architect to have a profile. And that profile can be handed over to someone that works in the, um, in the implementation team or the delivery team, the person that will actually install and provision the kit. Um, so no longer will I have to go along with your spreadsheets and your different pieces of information. You can hand over a profile now 
and they can get on with the next job. So if we go back, let's take a look at policy first. So first of all, you might be wondering why we configure in security policies before we've even provisioned the devices. This is actually intentional, and it's to demonstrate that we can logically configure these things even before we've ta taken delivery of the kit on site. Okay, so everything's virtual, and then when you do get the kit, you can use apps like Discovery and Plug and Play to bring them online, and then everything will be pushed down. And on the plug and play um, capability there, Ben, I know kind of in the past we customers have had to use like for example DHCP option 43 DNS. I've also heard that we recently launched something around cloud. Can you just speak to that a little bit as well? And yeah, share that with the guys. Certainly, that's a good point to uh, to mention because um, you know I suppose if we look in a traditional network, getting a device online was extremely hard. We would have to console in, we would have to put a base config on there, and pre-staging that for a massive site takes a significant amount of time. And I see some nods in the room, so if some of us have been there and done that. Um, but now we're plug and play, we've got several ways of doing it, and it doesn't matter where that's sitting. It could be sitting at your headquarters or a branch. Uh, it could even be sitting behind a NAT as well. Um, we can use an app to provision the device. We can also use something, as Pete said, called the cloud redirect. So when a device comes online, you just plug in the power cable, the network cable, that will speak to the cloud, and then through a zero touch provisioning system, that will now go into APKM, go into DNA Center, and you'll have full access to that device. So we're making it a lot easier now to uh, get that device into the system. So looking at the policy, as we mentioned at the start, it's very, very difficult to create segmentation in the network, because traditionally we've relied on things like VLANs and VRFs, but these are very complex technologies. And I read something last week that said, uh, the, you, know, you know, a normal human being in a few, uh, few years' time will no longer be able to log on to a device, actually work out where that packet's going, because if the network is segmented so much, how, how can you actually comprehend that? Okay, look at IoT. We look at all of the net, all of the devices and things that are coming onto the network, as Pete mentioned at the start. We really need to segment lines of business and make that really easy. So what I can do here, first of all, is create what's called a virtual network. So I've split them up into corporate, guests, and IoT. And then within here, I can add different security groups. So for example, within IoT, I've added the HVAC system, the IP cameras, um, LED lights, and stuff like that. So anything within one virtual network can speak to each other. But and where are these, sorry Ben, where have yeah. these groups actually come from that you're showing here? Yeah, so these groups have come from our Identity Services Engine, or ISE, but equally they can be imported from Active Directory as well. So if you already have group policies and groups set up in AD, you can very easily import them. You haven't got to actually start you know, doing them one by one in here. Cool. Yeah. So corporate would not be able to speak to guests or IoT uh, by default if you wanted Inter virtual network communication, you would have to do some sort of route leaking, go out to a router or a firewall. Uh, that's intentional. But there's another level of segmentation. What about if I had, um, say, a, a thing or a sensor that came onto the network and I found that it was doing something malicious? That was identified by Stealthwatch. How would I actually you know, quarantine that and how would I make sure that? that was no longer talking within our IoT virtual network. So um, I don't normally do this, but we like a challenge. So Pete's not an engineer, but I think you're up for this. So uh, would you mind demoing how we coming. can actually segment? <laughs> yeah, that's absolutely Give brilliant. it a go. So I'm going to show um, you guys how to actually configure a secure group tag. What was a secure group, secure group tag, micro segmentation um, on the network? and. Like I kind of said before, this is something that someone of my skill set most definitely couldn't do in the past. I tell you that much. And for some of you in here who could do it, you may not want to do it because of the amount of command you'd have to add in there. And obviously there's all the ongoing, what happens if you need to troubleshoot and you've had kind of staff churn and all that kind of good stuff. So this really helps out with that. So what I'm going to do is add a policy here. Um, and whilst this loads, got in this bottom corner here the ability to filter our virtual network so if you've created multiple virtual networks you know you, 
you've got lots of Active Directory groups, you may not want, it's not, you know, not quick and easy to trawl through all of those. So I can filter here straight down to the IoT virtual network and I see my four, my four groups there. Um, I can't do it because I'm holding the mic, but you can do multiple select, <laughs> okay? So you don't have to do what I'm about to do and drag them, drop them one by one. The platform's more intuitive than that. But as you can see here, I'm adding my various IoT type devices into um, a source group. And as you notice here, you can see the S to give you that indication. So when you are getting that high level view, you will see that there. The quarantine systems, I will put as my destination. I can name my policy, so block IoT to quarantine systems. And if you wanted to, you could add an additional description. But here is where I can actually apply my contract and I'm gonna set deny and save. So now what I'm saying is that if we identify something malicious happening between one of these devices, we use identity services engine as a policy engine to drive the enforcement through secure group tagging dynamically into the network to carve off one of these devices and put it into the quarantine systems area. That can no longer speak to the rest of the quarantine system devices. Now, when you configure this by default, it's a unidirectional configuration. This is running our EFT version of code. So in the actual official release code, you'll have a radial button. You'll be able to do that as bi-directional, just as a click of a button. So what I'm gonna do now is just save this policy. And what will happen is that this will then in turn be deployed. So deployed to where? It gets deployed to the identity services engine. So if any of you are familiar with that and have seen a TrustSec or secure, secure group tagging matrix, you then went into the ISC and went to the appropriate tab, you will see that traditional matrix of these various devices and what they can get access to and what they can't. Well, well done, Pete. I think you passed the test and I think that deserves a round of applause. Well done. So there we go. It's showing how simple that is. Um, no longer do you have to rely on complex access lists. And then when your boss comes to you and says, okay, what's the business intent of that access list in a year's time? And you go, um, I'm not quite sure, but I'm too scared to remove it. This hopefully gives you a better idea now of, uh, of how we're making it a lot more intuitive. So thanks, Pete. So let's go back to the, the final section, which is the provision section. So now we've got all of our design common network settings, our policies in place. We've taken delivery of the kit. Now we need to start installing it and provision it to our fabric. So this is what we use the provision app for. We can see here a list of the equipment that we've, we've got. Um, just some basic information, whether they're a switch, what, what their IP address is, serial number, um, whether they've been provisioned or not. Uh, I've previously configured my access switches here and my call switches. And you can see what site they've been assigned to, so San Jose. And you can also see that I've deployed those common network settings to them as well. And it's very simple. I would just click on these devices or I can click on all of them. There we go. And just via a drop down, I would be very easily be able to add them to a site, provision them, or even update the iOS image straight from here. So again, we're treating the network as an entity rather than a box by box approach. The next thing I wanna do is start going into my fabric. I can have everything in a default fabric if I really want to, or I can start creating multiple fabrics as we explained before at the start. So I've created a campus fabric here, and then it's my responsibility now to start assigning roles for the devices within the fabric. I'm not gonna go into a lot of detail of what these roles are, uh, because there's uh, some protocols that work behind the scenes. Again, if you want to know more, we'll, we'll be happy to go through that with you on the stand. But from a configuration perspective, it's actually very easy. So I've got an access layer switch here, and I would just be able to click on it, add it to the fabric, it would turn blue. It would now become part of the fabric and start, start behaving uh, and working with those protocols that are inherent to the fabric. Equally, if I go to the core switch here, I can assign this the role of a border. And the role of a border is to translate between the fabric and anything that's going out of the fabric. So a demarcation point between the campus fabric and a WAN, for instance. Okay? So Ben, going back to what you said before, the fact that you know this doesn't have to be a large scale network. If I was your customer, okay, and I wanted to deploy this into a small site, but let's say I had a mixed environment, I you know, I use Cisco, but there are some other devices there on the network. 
could I use this tool? Would this work in that kind of multi-vendor environment? Yeah, so great question. Uh, you'd be happy to know that it's not, not all Cisco. So for, for instance, here on our distribution layer, we can actually incorporate third-party devices from other vendors as well. All they need to understand is how to forward a layer three packet. Um, and what's actually doing the encapsulation and decapsulation are the devices that sit at the edge, the access layer switches and the core. So anything in between doesn't have to be Cisco, we can interoperate. And furthermore, we have an API as well that's built into DNA Center. So you can very easily integrate it with IPAM tools, with ticketing systems like ServiceNow. So no longer do you have to go onto the CLI, scream scrape or anything like that. You can very easily access that information on demand. That, that's a really good point on the ServiceNow integration. One of the, the engineers that we're fortunate enough to have based here in the UK did a really cool piece of work taking the APIs for DNA Center integrating it with Spark, which is one of our collaboration platforms, and created a bot. Now that bot that sits within Spark actually was able to be provided to first line support. So now they can actually engage directly with the network through a chat window, typing in, you know, some things, how many catalyst switches do I have at this location? You know, what protocols, what's running on these devices? How's the app, how are various applications deploy, deployed into that? So that simple use of common language now you can use that and it's just an example, but I mean, the options are limitless, right? So all the kind of DevOps people that you know may be in the room or that you have working within your organizations can really embrace some of these APIs and kind of, yeah, as I said, sky's the limit really as to what you can achieve. It's a lot easier than you think as well. You can use a simple tool like Postman to start testing this out, uh, send some calls to it, see what you can get out of the system. Just try it out. We have. Uh, lots of different demo environments that you can use, one being dCloud. So if you guys want to play with this, feel free to go to dcloud.cisco.com. We have a sandbox environment where you can access everything that we've shown today. And finally, now that we've provisioned the fabric, we want to get some hosts onto our network, so some wireless devices, some PCs, things like that. And this is where we do host onboarding. So within this section here, I can very easily specify the authentication method. For example, it could be .1x and I could assign it to a corporate virtual network. So essentially, no longer we have to rely on things like VLANs on every single switch. When a device comes on board, they will be authenticated, they would be uh, placed into the virtual network, for example, corporate, they would get their IP address, DNS settings, all of that that we specified before, and then if there are any segmentation policies that, um, that apply to that device, they will also be given that, and that will be pushed out by ISE. So everything's kind of orchestrated from that perspective and you haven't got to go box by box and configure everything from scratch. So that concludes our demo. Let's just um, wrap this up. So I just wanted to kind of initiate the wrap up here um, on actually some proof points. Now, one of our early adopters of this technology, manufacturing company in the petroleum industry, managed to achieve some significant benefits. Now, I know you probably see these types of slides from vendors all the time. This is not me saying that this is what you're gonna achieve. This is just the art of the possible and perhaps just to encourage you to think about where this type of tooling you know, could assist you. For example, what Ben said, jumping onto dCloud or downloading it through DevNet and starting to play with it. But in particular, this customer, improved network provisioning. A manufacturer, as you can imagine, lots of R&D going on, right? Segmenting networks is really, really important, but they're a manufacturer, they run two networks, IT and OT. For the first time, this manufacturer was actually able to converge those. So the saving on just infrastructure was huge. And as you can see here, improve, improved issue resolution, better visibility across the entire network itself, reduced security breach impact, because we've now got better segmentation actually enforced within the network. So these, I hope, will kind of you know, encourage you to go away and kind of th think about um, what the art of the possible is. There is one thing I would also add to this around Cisco's go-to-market. You've probably a lot heard a lot in the past about us shifting towards software. Okay, so before, you know, well, I say before, I'm talking about you know, seven, eight months ago, you wanted to buy a product from Cisco, buy a switch through one of our partners. You would buy that, we'd say, great, Here's your connectivity. You could go and rack and stack that. We might say to you, would you like some of the value add? Would you like some of these software capabilities? And whilst they sounded great, 
it might not have been your responsibility, it might have sat with another team, it might have been creating a business case, going through another budget cycle to get that approved, all these types of things. So we didn't exactly make it easy for you to get access to this. So what we've now done, our new range of switches, the CAT 9000, come over to the stand, check it out, have a conversation with us. Okay, there's a whole family there. But essentially, we package this capability in on top of that platform. The most attractive thing for you as potential customers of ours is that this is on price parity. So if you went out and bought, for example, a Catalyst 3850, buying the new 9300 with all of this software on top is going to cost you no more. We've got to change the way in which we provide you access to us, our technologies, our capabilities in the future. This is the best way to do it. And we encourage you to kind of use and embrace that because we're making it available to you. And the subscription element to that will mean that you will always get access to the latest and greatest updates. You won't get stuck on versions of code any longer that you can't move beyond or you've got to pay a fee to upgrade from. Okay, so it's a very big change for us as a business, very different way and a very different way which we want to work with you, our customers and partners. And as I said, come visit us on C28, but thank you for spending the time with us. We're getting flagged to finish. So I really appreciate the time and I hope you have a great day. Thank you.